Hi, and welcome to ECCB Connects. You've been hearing about cryptocurrency, bitcoins, mobile wallets, and digital currency. But how do these forms of payment work, and how can you access them? Stay with us, and we'll tell you more after the break. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Welcome back to ECCB Connects. On this week's episode, Grenville Williams, attorney at law and director at the Regional Security System Asset Recovery Unit, explains the difference between cryptocurrency and crypto assets, how these forms of payment work, how you can obtain them, and whether cryptocurrencies should be regulated. I would like to posit that we should really be calling bitcoins and the other 1,600 to 2,000 assets, crypto assets, and not cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin by way of example, in 2013, at the beginning in January, it was worth $20. By December of 2013, it was worth $1,000. In 2017, it started at roughly $1,000 US dollars per Bitcoin. By the end of that year, one Bitcoin was valued at approximately $20,000. Certainly, if we took the Eastern Caribbean dollar and we started the year at $20 and ended at $1,000, none of us in here would be very happy. And why is that? Because currencies have certain characteristics. One of those is that the currency must be a store of value. A crypto asset is technically at this time not a store of value. It should also be a unit of account. If I give you $1 today, tomorrow, theoretically, it should be worth $1. Certainly, there is volatility among currencies, but we are not talking jumps by thousands of percent. And in addition to being a store of value or a unit of account, and a currency should allow us to conduct transactions. To an extent, a cryptocurrency does that, but not fully. And therefore, that is why I would side with the chairman, former chairman of the US uh, mon uh, Currency Monitoring and certainly the chairperson of the Bank of England in saying those are not cryptocurrencies, they are crypto assets. Today is 10 years since the white paper by Sota Satoshi was launched. And basically what you wanted to do is create a currency that was outside of the normal channels, an alternative to those proposed and controlled by central banks. So much so that in 2008, when his white paper was launched, if we recall, that was also the beginning of the most significant financial crisis of our time. Therefore, a lot of people saw crypto assets as an alternative to currencies that were controlled by governments. But when his white paper was launched, crypto assets did not take much traction with the public. Cryptocurrencies were first utilized by persons predominantly in the underworld, persons who wanted to engage in illegal transactions. So you had a website called the Silk Road that traffic in narcotics, traffic in firearms, traffic in other illegal uh, commodities, and it is there traditionally that crypto assets first found traction. Outside of the Silk Road, crypto assets also found traction in places like WikiLeaks, which was an alternative type of newspaper or news source if we look at that way. There were one or two other areas that saw the benefit to crypto assets. And I speak here not as a person who's opposed to crypto assets or cryptocurrency. I am supportive. However, I think we need to distinguish between crypto assets, cryptocurrencies, and the technology that underlies these. And the technology is blockchain. And it is that technology that can be applied 
in many different avenues, in many different businesses, to many different solutions uh, to problems that we may encounter. And what blockchain is really, it's, well, something that is probably more comfortable for those persons who are computer scientists and specialists. What it does, it's a distributive ledger. So ultimately, if you undertake a transaction, that transaction is not stored in one place. It is stored across a number of computers. You heard the word nodes. And those nodes really capture the transaction. So that if there are 20 persons uh, using that particular currency or that transaction, the 20 persons will see that transaction at the same time. And that is how they keep a record of it. Because once that transaction is confirmed by those 20 persons, then theoretically, that transaction cannot be undone. It cannot be changed. And that is one way that Satoshi was able to um, solve a problem called double accounting. Once you spend that money, can you spend it a second time? And by using this mechanism, he solved that problem of double accounting. Where can you obtain Bitcoin or any of the other thousands of cryptocurrency? One, you could be a computer specialist or somebody who likes computers, and you could mine it. It's a very complex process. It's also a very energy-intensive uh, process. The other two ways you can get cryptocurrency, the simplest way, is somebody could gift it to you like any other um, property. But you could also purchase cryptocurrency. One cryptocurrency, uh, Bitcoin, on the markets right now, today it's worth about 6,200 US for one cryptocurrency. So certainly, if you have 6,200 US, you can purchase one Bitcoin. Ethereum and others are a little bit more cost effective, such as, uh, uh, I think Ethereum is about $200 today. One of the questions is, are we prepared in terms of regulations? Yes and no. I would say yes, whereas we may not have specific legislation or regulations dealing with crypto assets or cryptocurrency, it's an emerging technology. Therefore, what we should create is a sandbox. And what a sandbox really is, is that we allow the technology to be operated as sort of a pilot study. We look at it, we learn, and we see how regulations could best be applied not to stifle innovation, however. One person argued that had innovation been stifled in Silicon Valley by implementing regulations at a very early stage that stifled innovation, we would not have had the industry, similar to what we are speaking about now, coming out of Silicon Valley. Certainly, are there downsides to crypto assets and cryptocurrencies? Yes. For one, as mentioned earlier, there is significant fraud related to crypto assets. There are always going to be persons who want to benefit without doing the hard work related to the development of any product. Cryptocurrencies are generally anonymous. And therefore, if a person conducts a transaction, you may not be able to identify the person who conducted it, but just the transaction itself. Why is that a problem? One of the issues is that a crypto, a crypto asset is technically a bearer negotiable instrument. If I have it, I could spend it. It doesn't matter that it belongs to my colleague. And once I spend it, there is no way necessarily to identify that I am the one who spent it. And therefore, you have no redress to claim back your crypto assets. So imagine if you lost one Bitcoin today. I spent it at 6,000 plus US dollars. That's 6,000 dollars that you have lost. In addition to that, cryptocurrencies or assets are predominantly stored on exchanges. Those exchanges require you to get um, the private key, which is a string of numbers. Many of us in here cannot even remember our phone numbers if it's a new number. Imagine have, having to remember a number that stores your value. What has happened in some instances? Persons have lost those numbers. What does that mean? It means they cannot access their digital wallet, and if they had their $6,200 in there, that is lost to them. Has it been utilized for money laundering? Certainly it is. But so has other fiat currencies. So that is not necessarily a point against a crypto asset. As I said, there will be people who always do not want to work and apply their energies positively. So it will be exploited for money laundering, terrorist financing, 
um, and other forms of illegal activity. Should there be regulation? Yes. In the Eastern Caribbean the, um, Currency Union, there is no law or regulation that specifically address crypto assets or cryptocurrency. There is existing money laundering legislation that could potentially capture and deal with crypto assets. There's a case out of the United Kingdom where police seized some crypto assets and they dealt with it as property. So they were able to restrain it. They were able to take it and put it in a wallet and convert it on an exchange that operated in Amsterdam. Why they use the exchange as opposed to auctioning? Because it was cheaper, it was well recognized. One of the challenges with crypto, because it is so volatile, when they seized the crypto, let's say it was worth $6,000, by the time they converted it, it was worth less. So that's a factor as it relates to crypto assets. Two further points. The European Union is already through its fifth European Union directive, moving to implement regulations to deal with crypto assets or cryptocurrency. Further, the FATF, which sets the standards for money laundering, counterfinancing of terrorism, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, they have already moved to set regulations uh, to deal with crypto assets or cryptocurrency. So whether or not we want it regulated, it is going to be mandatory, just as we've had regulations for money laundering and TF to regulate our cryptocurrencies. Thank you very much. To view any episode of ECCB Connects anytime, any place, at your convenience, check us out on YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn at ECCB Connects. And now, this week's financial tip. Develop a spending plan so that you can know where your money goes. Spend your money wisely to achieve your financial goals. We've come to the end of this episode of ECCB Connects. Join us next week when we'll continue looking at financial technology and developments in our payment system with fintech developer Alex Strawn. Be sure to join us.